Hello, it's Sarah from Hardcover Hearts, and I'm here with my week of reading wrap-up. This is where I talk about the books that I read last week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. I had a phenomenal week. I have a lot of books to talk about, so let's jump right in. Uh, the first thing I teed up last week because I was so impressed with uh, where her writing was kind of hitting this like personal niche of interests that I have, and so it, I felt like it was speaking directly to me, and it actually became even more intense as the book went on. This is a brand new release. This is uh, Rachel Kushner's The Hard Crowd, Essays 2000 to 2020. I just think this cover is absolutely gorgeous, but I love the spine detail. It's like this super simple pink little spine right there. I think it's so clever. So I really don't know how to talk about this book. Um, and the reason I say that is because it feels so personal, if that makes any sense. Uh, so uh, why does it feel that way? Um, Rachel Kushner is from San Francisco. And so she writes about San Francisco during the years that I lived here too. I think she's a little bit older than I am, but those scenes were still vibrant uh, when, when I lived here. Now, there is a, a subset of scene that she engaged in and, and participated in and hung out with that I wasn't a part of. I was never a part of the bar scene in San Francisco. But uh, the music scene, the art scene, the motorcycle scenes, um, these were all sub genres and, and uh, groups of people that I that I knew very well. What she does in this book is she gives you a sense of a place um, these are all different essays, and it's a span of different of different things. Some are political, some are are uh, kind of looks at different artists, uh, literary artists, visual artists, film and photography, um, and and then also just kind of her reflections on the city that was and and San Francisco uh, from a different time. Uh, so any of that, I feel like people who watch my channel might be able to anchor to at least one of the essays in here. I, I think the, the thing that was most interesting to me was not just the things that I already knew that had her, that she was amplifying, but things I didn't know. She's one of the things I really liked the most about Rachel Kushner and what I loved about the flamethrowers, which is one of my favorite books, is uh, someone who has wide, wide interests. Um, globally, she's she's interested in a lot of places. She's interested in kind of rat holing into specifics and sub sub genres. Um, so, like Italian cinema of the seventies, um, the art scene of New York City in the seventies, um, specific motorcycles. She talks about one of my favorite models, which is a uh, Vincent uh, Black Shadow, which I just you want to talk about a sexy motorcycle. Uh, she talks about cars, uh, you know, and, and you sense that she goes really deep into this. She gets really into the research of it. Now she was a child prodigy. I don't know if you could say child prodigy is the right thing, but she started going to Ber UC Berkeley at age 16. So incredibly intelligent, a very, very curious uh, mind. She talked about Marguerite Duras, and she talked about um, uh, prison abolition and the way the prison abolition uh, debate is being framed and some opportunities to really get to the center of what makes people uncomfortable about it. So I personally, I gave, I, I think this is magnificent. I gave it a five. I am, will be really curious to see what other people think of this. Um, Shawnee is going to be is reading this from Pastori Time. And uh, congratulations on hitting a thousand subscribers. Long overdue. You you and Bert are amazing. So congratulations there. But uh, she's going to be reading this. And I, I'm looking forward to watching what other people's reactions. Uh, because like I said, I know, I feel like I'm so close to the material that that I think my biases are really coming through here. And I'd be curious to know how just a regular reader who doesn't have the same kind of personal connection to the people, places, and, and things that she's talking about, how did they respond to this? So I'll be curious to, to find out. But for me, it was a slam dunk. Okay, then I, uh, oh, and that was a net galley, but I loved it so much, I, I went out and bought the book. 
So continuing the net galley busting, here's another one that was on my net galley. This is the newest release from Anna Lee Hooper. This is uh, Murder Most Fair. It's the fifth number of the Verity Kent series. Now I like this series. I think it's it's fun. It's a mix of spy um, mystery type of, of stories set in World War One. Uh, so we we're getting a sense of of grief and longing, and specifically our main character having to come to terms with grief uh, and the loss of her favorite brother uh, that she is really loath to do. So she has really isolated herself from her family because. She just didn't want to face it on top of all of the other horrors that were going on with war. I, I, I liked this one. I like the Verity Camp series. Uh, however, there is a side plot that was more prevalent in previous, previous books that they kept having to bring back up and explain. And I'm worried that the plot is becoming too complex to carry on in a long term with a long series uh, because it was so repetitious at times. I was like, yeah, okay. I remember, I get it. Uh, and even you've said that already, it felt like you, it had been set earlier in the book itself. So that's a little, a little troubling. So we'll see how this, how this continues on. The next book I read was uh, also net galley. Uh, this I, ironic. I had already queued it up. I was already ready to go. The impudent ones by Marguerite Duras. And this actually uh, is her debut that has been found and a new translation has been done for it. And, you know, it was really interesting to see the, the seeds of, of who Marie Duras would become and who she would, how she would evolve as a writer. Uh, she's famously known for The Lover and uh, a, bunch of other, a bunch of other books and just has a, an incredibly interesting backstory uh, in her life and is, is just a, a interesting, an, an interesting writer. Uh, she, she, we see some themes that we'll see in her later work. Uh, you know, the horrid older brother who abuses his place in the, in the family, who is adored by a controlling and domineering mother who is very happy to just completely uh, ignore and push everyone else aside to focus her love and joy on this horrible son who then become, grows more horrible through the, the joy and love of his mother. Uh, we have in this, in this family, we have them having to flee Paris into the country because uh, the older brother Jacques has done some bad things and have, is owing people. And so they're kind of escaping the bailiffs and the people that he owes money to. While they're in the country, there's a plot to kind of secure a foothold into society by marrying off Maud, the younger daughter, who's the one that we kind of follow, uh, to um, so, so some society people because they want the land, uh, the country land that they have, that they own. And so it's advantageous to the mother to do this for her uh, societal connections. Uh, but, you know, Maud rebels. She doesn't want to. And so she gets involved with, with someone and has a, an inappropriate affair and what, how that eventually leads, what that does to this, to this family. Uh, you know, this was, it was good. It was a, a good first, first novel. I, I wouldn't say it's absolutely not her best, but I think if you're someone who likes uh, seeing where our, where artists start and where authors start and the, the progression of their work, this is a good place to, uh, to revisit. Uh, and what I especially liked was all of the notes and, and contextualization of the book uh, that happens at the end of the book, like an afterward. I thought that was exceptionally well done. So then I needed something entirely different. I wanted to get away from the net galley race <laughs> that, I was, that I've been on. And a book came that reminded me that I had some back work to do. And the book is The Adventures of Miss Barbara Pym. And this is by Paula Byrne. I just think that cover is remarkable. Now, this is a chunkster. I may hold this off until nonfiction November. We'll see. Uh, but uh, I know that there's been some conversations uh, that I've seen on Instagram and in the BookTube community about where to start with Barbara Pym. Now, I read Excellent Women, I think, last year, and I just, 
It was so poignant and beautiful and funny. Uh, you know, older, older unmarried woman uh, who is just uh, connected to the church and does like the, is an excellent woman because she always is supporting the church and, and helping in church functions and things like that. So I know that she has that point of view, you know, kind of um, the community of church, uh, of church women. And this is, this next book is also considered one of her best and it is Some Tame Gazelle. I, I fell in love with it. It was, I thought it was so charming and it was exactly what I needed. I love a comedy of manners and this is that, Carbzalt. It is, we've got two women, uh, sisters who live together. They're older in their fifties and they, it's Harriet and Belinda. And Belinda has been in love with the Archdeacon, Archdeacon since they were young. Uh, and she just, it's, she's not able to let go of it. And so, uh, but she's smoldering and, and holding it in because she's a reserved and um, kind woman. Whereas Harriet is she doesn't do anything inappropriate except for the fact that she kind of takes possession and coddles the curates uh, that come into this little village. And, and, and there's a lot of competition in the women for social standing of, you know, who can take care of these, of, of these religious men uh, in the best way possible. And so it's really funny. It's really funny. Uh, the competition and, the, and you, you have to remember the time period. So, you know, after the wars, so many men of, in England were killed in the war. So there's a real deficit of men. And then to have, you know, these kind of shiny good men as uh, in, in the religious order come and, and, and could marry, you know, these, these aren't priests. Uh, you know, I can imagine that being very attractive for in a sleepy little village uh, where there just aren't a lot of, of new things coming in. So it's just it's it was funny. Uh, it was it was charming, a little snide, a uh, very insular. You just really got a sense of this community. Now, there was uh, there is a, a plot where um, a missionary comes back from Africa and is trying to, to share some of the things that he learned from, from the tribe that he's trying to convert and proselytize to. And he keeps like lapsing in and, and into like song from, from the village. And a lot of that felt, uh, you know, this reeks of colonialism. But I think Barbara Pym worked that magic of, of talking about like how ridiculous he looks in uh, coming back and trying to, trying to espouse you know, these things. And at the same time, how ridiculous it is going there in the first place. Uh, it, it, she poked fun at him in a way that I approved. I don't know if she goes as far as she, she absolutely didn't go as far as denouncing colonialism without a doubt, you know, but I, I liked her poking fun at this character and his ridiculousness. Uh, so that, that for the time that felt like it was a step in the right direction. Uh, yeah. So that was that. And then uh, I finished Virginia Woolf's The Voyage Out. I am working on my vlog. Uh, I, <laughs> the problem is there's so much to talk about. Look at all of these tabs. There's so much to talk about. So I'm really trying to curate uh, my thoughts and, and in a way that's that could be appealing and could be something that if you want to read Voyage Out, you can use as a companion is kind of how I was thinking about it. Like we're doing a buddy read together. Uh, so I need to go back through and, and I think I also need to add some overarching pieces, uh, to talk about it. Be on the lookout. I'm, I'm, I'm working. I'm still working on it. I'm trying not to make it excruciatingly long <laughs> is what I'm trying to do. Um, but entice and, and encourage you to, to join in the conversation. Um, and I'm also trying to not put spoil, uh, trying not to spoil it, but at the same time, does a reading vlog, is a reading vlog spoilery or not? Maybe I don't think I should do spoilers. Or if I do, maybe I'll put like big warnings, like spoiler ahead, spoiler ahead. We'll see. We'll see. So trying, still trying to work out that model, but I'll start doing the same for, for the next, for the next uh, Virginia Woolf that I'll be reading this month. So let's go on. I we also uh, found out that there was a new Jacqueline Winspear out. So this is the Macy Dobbs series. 
this is one of the series that really got me into a really loving women detectives of the inner war period. Uh, at, you know, from a modern perspective, looking back, I, I just found this, this so charming and such a smartly written uh, series, uh, the Macy Dobb series. And so this is number 16. And I am here to tell you, I think it's her best. I think it is her best. Uh, so through, this is the consequences of fear. I should say that. Now, what uh, the Macy Dobbs series does best is it has they transitioned her from this young girl who has been apprenticed into detecting and solving cases into uh, transitioning into being a spy because of her her ability to de to detect, her ability to think on her feet, her intelligence. So all of these things have have come into play, and so now the books really are a combination. There's there's a mystery at the heart of it, but then there's also what's happening in in wartime. And I think that Jacqueline Winspear does such an exceptional job at, at at being able to present and keep everything focused. I I think Verity Kent could use a little more of the of the Maisie Dobbs style, um, but you don't want them to be the same, right? Um, however, uh, there's a lot of tension in this book about France and England. So they're allies, but there is the sense of who's in charge and who's making the decisions and how is that trickling down to the leadership uh, and the people who are trying to work together in, in London and in England uh, and risking their, their spies and their women agents to go over uh, into France and to help occupy France. I thought that was quite fascinating. And then we also have, uh, you know, a tra the, the uh, murder mystery at the heart of it. Um, and then there's also where she's having, she's been asked to help recruit women to be spies and to go into occupied France. And I think this is where her idea of sacrifice and and what are you willing to give up for this war, uh, it really gets tested. It's just an exceptional book. And I, I think that Jacqueline Winspear is, can do nuance and can do subtlety and can do emotion very, very well. And then speaking of starting at the beginning, uh, so for Aussie April, I only got a chance to read The Year of Wonders by Geraldine Brooks. And I need, and I really wanted to get to another one, but I was still in this mystery mood and I've fallen in love with the Franny Fisher series. So I wanted to, to reach out to that and, and go back to the very first one, which is called Cocaine Blues. And in this, we have, we have uh, Franny Fisher starting off in, on the continent and she is asked to investigate a, a man's daughter. Uh, she's, She's in a marriage that they don't really like. They think that the husband is mistreating her. They have sent her away to, to, to get better because she kept falling into these horrible, horrible sicknesses. She would, she would be sent away. She would get better. She'd go back and fall sick again. And so they, they thought there was foul play at, at hand. And they asked her to go uh, back to her home in Australia. So she goes back to, to Melbourne. Uh, and, but, She's coming back as really a conquering heroine because her, even though they were incredibly poor uh, as she was growing up, incredibly poor, um, because of the war, a series of, of family members died and left her father a lord and they inherited. So she's coming back uh, with money, status, and, uh, and a lot of privilege. And it's just fun to see how she plays with that and, and her, always her acknowledgements of being on both sides of, of, of the class divide. So atmospheric. Uh, Phryne as a character is amazing. She's bold, brash, uh, heart, deep heart, but also doesn't take, doesn't uh, suffer fools lightly, uh, can read a room very well and is aware of her power, her sexual magnetism, her power. Uh, she is a sexual being. She embraces it. And uh, and I love that. I absolutely love that. 
uh, makes no apologies for herself, which I also love. Uh, the other thing that's really great about this is uh, there's just a lot of really progressive ideas that are interwoven in here. So in this story as well, there is a subplot of um, botched uh, abuse of women through uh, botched uh, abortions. So there's a doctor who uh, extols his fee through raping the women and then giving them abortions. And one woman is, ne is near death. And Franny is so outraged that she tries to make sure that she can find out who's doing this and bring them to justice, even though that's not the reason that she's there. And so you just get the sense of just fantastic um, uh, ethos and uh, desire to help women. Uh, there's also a drug case that comes in here and she just weaves this all in very seamlessly. There's always like uh, what I found, this is the third I've read. I've, I've read these out of order, but she weaves big stories, kind of sensational type things and places them contextually and where it makes sense. It doesn't feel like it's too outlandish and, and really makes you think. And she, she always has a few different cases that go on at the same time, but they don't always interconnect, which I like. I, I can't believe this is the debut and the first of a series. I've read a lot of first of series and usually it's like so much uh, context setting and building the characters and all this. And she just dove right in. Carrie Greenwood knows what she's doing. Uh, literally maybe Maisie Dobbs, uh, this series, Franny Fisher, and of course, uh, Inspector Gamash may be my favorite mystery series for, without a doubt. Okay, so that's what I've read, right? Amazing reading week. Let me talk about what I'm currently reading. Uh, still slow progress with Marcel Proust in Search of Lost Time, the Germantes Way, volume three. Then for my In Real Life book club, we're reading the Booker shortlist, and this is Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi. So just started this and uh, looking forward to talking to them about this in the end of the month have started the next of my project with Elizabeth the Bookish North. This is Virginia Woolf's Night and Day. I'm doing all of these in Oxford Press, University Press editions. And like I mentioned, I'll do a, vid a vlog of this as well. Uh, then also I'm reading Superior Women by Alice Adams. So I just did a video on, uploaded it on Friday. Uh, I received a gift uh, box from Leo from a little book life. Uh, he and I do a lot of our readings together and in it was one of this book and a few others. Uh, and I also unboxed my latest uh, subscription to Shakespeare and Company. So check that out if you're so interested. But uh, this is a book that Leo has talked about and specifically this author. So I was really excited to get, get started and I couldn't put it down last night. I'm already, I would say a third of the way through it. Then um, also I'm going to participate in the 1900 to 1950 readathon, which sounds absolutely delightful. And you know how much I love the interwar period. So this will be an opportunity for me to really deep dive in there. And then I also want to read a bunch for the Asian readathon because I, uh, I think it's incredibly important, especially, especially now with all of the anti-Asian violence that's happening uh, to make sure that we are thoughtful and supporting our Asian brothers and sisters and, and reading literature that comes from, from their voices. So looking forward to that. And I've got a ton of books for both of those. So I'll do a special, special video about those pile of possibilities. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, but uh, wherever you are in the world, I really hope that you still, still uh, focus on the positives and uh, we are still in a global pandemic, obviously, from what's happening in India and what's also happening in Brazil and other countries in South America that are starting to, to struggle. So uh, until we are able to eradicate this, please still maintain safe social distance. Uh, wear two masks if you're not vaccinated. Wear one if you are, uh, unless you're outside. I guess it's okay if you're outside and, and maintain social distance and, and uh, away from people. Uh, wash your hands often and do not touch your face. So on that note, I will leave you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll look forward to talking to you later. Bye.